Good morning. If we could uh, find our seats, we'll uh, get started. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning to our service at First Baptist Church of Prairieville. If you're visiting with us, we are so glad to have you. And uh, we just ask that you look in your bulletin that you receive, that there's a little tear out there that you can fill out and place that in the offering plate. Put your name and uh, any questions you have or prayer requests that you might have. And we would pray for those prayer requests. I'd like to read from uh, Psalm 2. Why do nations rage and people plot in vain? The king of the earth sets themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bond apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord says to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you uh, uh, that you are uh, in control, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, we just praise your holy name uh, that you reign, you reign upon the earth. Uh, Lord, and... Uh, we just, uh, we thank you for, for that love and that uh, constant in our lives, knowing that you're there for us. We also thank you for Jesus, for those that kiss the sun has life, as the scriptures say. Lord, I just thank you for that gift, uh, for salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. I just pray that uh, as... Uh, as we witness to others, I pray that they would uh, receive that gift. Lord, may we be witnesses uh, for you. Lord God, I thank you for this country. I thank you for the freedoms that we have. Even today, we can meet together and praise your holy name. Uh, we just uh, lift up our country to you and the many needs that it has, the many concerns that we have about the way our country is going. And, Lord, I just pray for the leaders of our country. I pray that you would just uh, be with them, Lord. I pray that they would kiss the sun and come to know you as Lord and Savior. Help, Lord, we just pray that you would help them to make right decisions for us according to your scripture. Lord, I just praise you for this gathering. I thank you for each one that is here and our desire to, uh, uh, to worship you and to please you, Lord, uh, through song, through prayer, through uh, just being together with one another. Uh, Lord God, I just uh, lift up this time to you. May you be glorified through what we do and what we say. I pray that you be with Brother Derek as he uh, stands before us with the truth this morning. I pray that you would use him in a mighty way. Use the word uh, to reach into our hearts. Open our eyes to the truth, and Lord, may we apply it uh, to our lives. Lord God, we just thank you for this time together. We ask it all in the precious name of our loving Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
I love that psalm that Emery just read for us, Psalm 2. It's about the kingship of Jesus Christ, if you were paying close attention. Uh, that psalm says that Christ reigns even right now. So we have, in fact, entered into a new year, and yet Christ is on the throne. He, he reigns. That's a good reminder, no matter what might come our way. Well, uh, we have a tradition here of, at the beginning of each new year, going over our church covenant together as a church family. And we're getting ready to do, in fact, just that here in a minute. But I wanted to say a couple of, of words about what this is that we're getting ready to do and recite together, uh, lest this just be mundane and just kind of lip service. Uh, the covenant's actually a big deal, and, and I hope to even open your eyes to that for just a second. You might be wondering, like, our church speaks a lot of membership, <clears throat> and that's not because, you know, we made that up at some point, you know, and just, oh, that, that's just a really good way to be organized or something like that. Maybe that's true. Uh, membership is biblical, friends. It, it's biblical. The Bible doesn't picture the Christian life outside of doing it with a local body of believers. In other words, if you search the New Testament, what you'll see is that the picture of the Christian life is always within a local body. God has designed the Christian life to be, to be done with one another. And so what we see then in the New Testament is that <clears throat> a local church is a group of baptized believers who are living the Christian life together. Uh, they're holding one another accountable. They're help, encouraging one another in the Lord. They're pointing to Christ. They're exhorting one another, helping each other kill sin and put on righteousness, helping each other fix their eyes on the glory that is to come. That is the picture of Christianity. So this idea of like, well, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm good with being a Christian, but I'm not really about the local church. Well, friend, that's a foreign idea, according to the New Testament. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not just that. It's like this is a glorious thing we're a part of, like belonging to a family of believers, having brothers and sisters who help us, who encourage us, who rebuke us when we need it, belonging and being under elders who teach us God's word, disciple, counsel. This is a good picture. Uh, this is a good design that the Lord has made. This is the, the local church. So when we're reciting this covenant, what we're doing is we're pledging ourselves to be committed to what the Bible calls us to. That's what the church covenant is. It's just a summary of what the Bible calls us to do as this particular people. We are a local church, and therefore, we speak a certain way. We live a certain way. We look a certain way. We do certain things. And this marks us out as different from the rest of the world around us. We're a redeemed community, right? And that's going to play itself out. So don't think that the covenant is like, this is just kind of man-made, and oh, that's kind of nice. Like We've pulled this directly from the New Testament, and what we're doing now together is saying we are committed to being what God has called us to be. Not just in this new year, that is true, but every day, every day as Christians. One last thing, uh, the, this covenant, uh, this, is not, this is not divinely inspired. This isn't the Bible. This is what we would say, it's just a quick summary of what we do think the Bible calls us to, right? Friend, if I could give you one last encouragement before we read this. You should spend some time reading and going over the church covenant from time to time. Anyone who joins our church has to go through the covenant. Many of you, or at least some of you, have done that with me. You have to go through the covenant. You have to pledge yourself to it, of course. Uh, but it's good for us to do this from time to time, not just maybe once a year at the beginning of the year, but uh, I don't know, every once in a while, pull it out and, and ask the Lord to help you to be faithful to what he's called you to be as a local church member. If you're interested in church membership, or perhaps you're starting to think about, man, is this really important? You should see me, see an elder after the service. We'd love to talk to you more about that, okay? So I invite you all to stand now. This is for the brothers and sisters of First Baptist Perryville. This is our covenant. If you're a guest, we're so glad you're here. Uh, you don't necessarily have to join in with us. This is for First Baptist Perryville. So brothers and sisters, we're going to recite this together. The word should be right behind me here in a second, and I will uh, try to keep a pace so we can all be together. So here we go. 
having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We engage not to pursue legal action or sue the pastors, elders, church staff, or members of the church in connection with the performance of their official duties. We also engage to maintain family and personal devotions, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to live in a manner worthy of our calling, to be just in our dealings, to be faithful in our commitments and responsibilities, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive anger, to refrain from the use of alcohol that would influence our words and actions, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid one another in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and Christian courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the teachings of Scripture to secure it without delay. We moreover engage that when we move from this place, we will, as soon as possible, unite with some other church where we can carry on the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Amen. Well, you may be seated. And let me now pray and ask God to help us to be faithful to this covenant, which really means to be faithful to what he's called us to do and to be as the redeemed people of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help as we enter into a new year that we would be faithful to what you've called us to that we would be faithful, not just as individual Christians, that's true, but as a local church, you've designed it this way, that the local church is supreme. The Christian life is, it is designed to, to operate within this context of local baptized believers that we call, that you call the church. Lord, I pray for our people right now that we go deeper into our local church, that we love our brothers and sisters, that we serve them and that we open ourselves up to be served by them. Lord, for some of those among us who have been a little bit maybe kind of closer to the fringes, I pray you draw them deeper and deeper into this family, that they would exhort one another, be exhorted by another, Lord, that they would go deeper into love for God and love for each other. Lord, I pray that there would be healthy, strong, Christ-centered, God-exalting relationships permeating this family, that we truly would see one another as brothers and sisters marching on the same mission together to pursue, to glorify, to live for Jesus Christ. So help us, Lord, to be faithful to these words that we just read. May they not just be lip service. May they not just be 
uh, something that's on some paper that we saw some time ago. But may we be committed to these things, the very things that you, our Lord, have instructed us to give ourselves wholeheartedly to. And Lord, as we do this, I pray that you fill the saints, fill this local church, fill these brothers and sisters with joy and love and peace. Because as we live and enjoy you, our God, we know that this is true life. And Lord, we know that there is no true life. There's no true happiness. There's there's no true joy found outside of the local church, but only within it. So Lord, I pray that you work in all these ways, ultimately, foundationally, so that you get glory. Lord, I pray that as we enter into another year, that we, all our days this year, and in all the days of the years to come, would be a people that bring glory to your name. When First Baptist Church of Perryville is thought of, may it be thought that we are people who love and glorify God. So Lord, work this way for our good, for your glory. And we ask this, of course, in Christ's name, who's redeemed us, who even right now is at the right hand, interceding for us. His glorious name. Amen. Please stand as we um, call, or do our call to worship. Great is thy faith.
Our offertory scripture today comes from Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for your word that teaches us you are the sovereign God of all the earth, of all the world. You are the creator, you are the sustainer, and you are the giver. And Father, we thank you for the privilege of your presence with us. We thank you for the ability to give back to you all the things you have given us. We pray that we would do that cheerfully and that... uh, we as a church would use it in a manner that would be pleasing to you. Bless the gift and bless the giver. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. stand as we continue to worship the Lord.
This morning's responsive reading comes from Galatians chapter 5. We'll be reading verses 16 through 25 together. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you do not want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit.
be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is from Galatians chapter 6, uh, verses 7 through 10, and can be found on page 975 in your pew Bible. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The grass withers, the flowers fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Good morning. Let's open in prayer. Father, we are in desperate need of your truth. We are in desperate need of the reality of who we are, who you are, and our great need. I am not sufficient to stand here and represent that truth, so I pray that your spirit would work not only in my heart, but in the heart of those who hear, that that truth would be a reality, not only in our minds, but in our actions, that we would apply the truth of your word in a way that would ultimately glorify you, that would ultimately lead to us living a life that would be like Christ. We are dependent upon you. In your name, amen. As I was preparing for this morning, Stephen from the book of Acts kept coming to my mind. Stephen was appointed by the apostles to help care for the needs of the church because they judged him to be a man that was seeking, that was saved. And so in the process of him doing that, he was placed in a position where he had to defend the gospel. He had to defend the ministry of Christ. And he did that among a bunch of religious leaders who hated him and hated that message. Stephen knew that. And so he had to display a tremendous amount of courage as he did so. And ultimately, they stoned him to death because of that. What's interesting is the last thing that he said before he died was, Lord, please don't hold this against them. The reason that kept coming to my mind is I try to place myself in the shoes of those biblical people and try to understand what would it take? How could you have that amount of courage? How could you have that perspective as somebody is stoning you to death? I believe one of the things that is required for that is what we're going to talk about this morning. We have to believe that there is more to this life than this physical space. There is more to this life than the house that we live in, the jobs that we work, the places we go, the, the people we know. There has to be a faith and a belief that there is something that will happen that is much greater to us once we die. That death is the doorway to an eternity with God, which will be far better than what we have today. So this is called the importance of a kingdom perspective. We will be in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. If I had to summarize our message this morning, There we go. If I had to summarize it, it's also in your bulletin that living the Christian life can be difficult. Following Christ is often places us in a position of difficulty. But because we have the Spirit and we have the promise of eternity, 
we have the ability to follow Christ. So just a recap, because it's been a while since we've been in Galatians. Galatians was a letter written by Paul, and it was written to... I'm really regretting the animations that I put in this now. All right. uh, Trying to find the magic spot, and I'm not finding it. Oh, yeah. It wasn't on. (laughs) All right. I guess we're, yeah, my bad. All right, so the letter of Galatians was written by Paul, and it was written to a group of churches in a region called Galatia, which is in modern-day Turkey. It was a collection of different churches that he had passed through, that he had founded, that he had been an encouragement to, and we believe that it was written somewhere around 51 AD, meaning that he wrote that sometime, probably while he was in Corinth, in the church in Corinth, And it was probably about a year since he was in these Galatian churches. So in that time that that year passed, a bunch of people had come in and perverted the gospel that Paul had given to these churches. Basically, they added some things, they took some things away, and they did their best to disparage the ministry that Paul had in these churches. Basically, they were trying to discredit Paul and his gospel. Paul, we can, we can organize Paul's letter into three areas. In the first part of Galatians, Paul is defending the gospel. And by defending the gospel, he's defending himself because they were basically accusing him of not having the authority to give a gospel. And he's also defending the gospel that he received from Jesus Christ. In the middle part of Galatians, he defines that gospel. Okay, he's trying to explain to them, okay, this is the gospel that I gave you. This is why it's important that you receive the Spirit and did these things. But he also tries to help them understand the gospel in light of the Old Testament because it seems that the attack against his gospel was that the law still had to be obeyed. And so he tries to help them understand that the Old Testament law was not there to give salvation The Old Testament law was there to make it obvious that salvation was not something we could obtain through our good works. Instead, we needed a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. And then in the last portion of Galatians, he's going to demonstrate the gospel. He is going to basically try to help us understand that if the gospel is real, if we can be saved through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, What does that mean? What does that look like? What difference does it make? And so when we believe and we trust in the death of Jesus Christ as the only way for us to be reconciled with God, we do that because God gives us the Spirit. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, it comes into our lives. And so that is the big concept of what he's trying to communicate in chapter 5. And so he sets up this dichotomy between a life that is driven by the Spirit or led by the Spirit and a life that is driven or led by the flesh. We see in Galatians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul establishes the idea that we receive the Spirit when we accept, when we have faith, when we become saved. Verse 2 says, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Farther down in verse 5, he says, So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? It is faith that brings about salvation through the Spirit, and then that Spirit indwells us. And so now... Paul in chapter 5 is going to say, okay, what does the spirit-led life look like? And what does the flesh-led life look like? And so we see in chapter 5 and verses 5, 16, 18, and 25, he he makes it clear in verse 5, for we through the spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Basically, if we have the spirit, we have the hope of righteousness And that's pointing to eternity. That's 
pointing towards the kingdom. It's the same hope that Peter talks about. We have a living hope that when we die, we will be with Christ. That is the hope that the Spirit gives us. But if you look forward to verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit, verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Paul is trying to establish this idea that the biggest difference between those who are of faith and those that are not of faith is the presence of the Holy Spirit. If we have the Spirit, what does our life look like? It doesn't look like, verses 19 through 21, that is what it looks like when we don't have the Spirit. We do the deeds of the flesh, which are evident. They are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. It goes on. It's not an inclusive list of every sin that we can possibly do, but it gives us a really clear idea that it is sin. The result of a life led by the flesh is sin. It's bad. It's not good. It's separation from God. It's displeasing. It's disobedience. But if we are led by the Spirit, if we walk by the Spirit, verse 22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Chapter 5 demonstrates that the Spirit is the power. It is the source of the Christian life. He uses the analogy of fruit. Think of an apple tree. Where does an apple tree get its nourishment? It gets it from the sun. It gets it from the ground. It gets it from the water. It pulls the minerals out. For the Christian, our nourishment comes from the Spirit. We gather our nourishment through our relationship with the Spirit in order to create that fruit. We cannot create that spiritual fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. We can't do that if we are not gaining that nourishment through the Spirit. We are wholly dependent upon the Spirit. And so that brings us to our passage this morning. The deception. Verse 7 of chapter 6 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Do not be deceived. He starts out there with a warning that we must not be deceived. I am not a great person, but I did see that there were eight different words that Paul could have used to, to pass this idea of deception or a lie. But he chose a particular word, planeo. And that word especially emphasizes the idea of a subtle lie, a subtle deception, something that is meant to kind of nudge you in a direction towards a deception, towards a lie. The goal is not to make it so obvious that the deception would then become obvious, to make the deception so loud that we kind of are alerted to it, but that it is so gentle and so soothing that it maybe casts a little bit of doubt. It maybe causes us to wonder, maybe to roam, maybe to think about, maybe to lose our assurances and the truths that we have in our own mind. Paul is warning the Galatians here of a particular deception, but I think it's not too hard for us to reckon that we are deceived today that we are in the midst of a world that seeks to give us all sorts of deceptions. There's no God. There's no truth. There's no black and white. There's really just a lot of gray. We're the most important person. We define when a life begins and when a life ends. We basically are God's. But it can also be a lot more subtle than that. It can come from people that maybe we respect, people that would associate within our circles. Maybe, maybe it's a, a Christian organization. Maybe it's somebody who flies a banner of a Christian flag, but then does something that maybe also can be deceiving. God is love. Is God love? Does God love? Yes. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So certainly God does love. But if we overemphasize God's love and underemphasize other aspects of God's character, we deceive ourselves into believing things like, well, God loves us so much he couldn't possibly send anybody to hell because he loves us so much. So he's going to make a way. He, he's going to work it out. Even if people really don't believe, he just, he loves all people. And those types of deceptions are much closer to home. Those deceptions are the things that grasp and strangle new Christians who do not understand the truth of God's work and are easily taken by those types of deceptions. So because this is a command, he's not asking us to not be deceived. He's warning us, do not be deceived. It is a command meaning we have to do something in order to guard ourselves against deception. In this case, the Galatians are going to use the same thing that we use, and that's God's truth, God's word, God's promises. You probably heard this, uh, this analogy before, but when they train secret service agents to detect counterfeit bills, they don't study counterfeit bills. What do they study? They study the real thing. Because it is by knowing the truth, knowing the real thing, by which we are going to be able to detect deceit and counterfeit. So the question is, is do we understand, do we seek the truth in order to sniff out, in order to detect that deceit? That is what we are called to do. And it's important. Why? Why? Because the next words that he uses there, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Does it ever occur to us that if we allow ourselves to be deceived in this way, that we become part of the mockery? That we would participate in things that would mock God? That's a sad thought. That's a sober thought. And we must be careful that we detect those deceptions so that we do not become part of that mockery. The mockery that he's, he's talking about here is likened to the idea that we would ridicule the truth in a way and treat it as if it's a lie. We take the truth and then we treat it as if it's a lie. An example of this is in Matthew 27 when Jesus is being sent to the cross. What do the Roman soldiers do with him? They put a, a, a purple, meaning like kingly tunic on him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They put a sign over his head that says, King of the Jews. Did they believe that? No. What were they doing? They were mocking him. They were taking the truth. Is he the king of the Jews? Yes. He's the king of all men. Will he someday wear a crown? Yes. Will he be adorned with uh, kingly dress? Yes. And the fact that they were mocking him, that is the same danger that we have today, that we would take the truth of God and we would treat it as a lie. We must be vigilant that we do not become part of that mockery. What is the particular deception? The deception we see is that for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Meaning that the deception that is being put forward in this Galatian church is that you can sow something, you can plant something, and it might or may or not come to fruition. Meaning you can do bad things, and maybe bad consequences won't come about. That is the deception. Paul uses another agricultural analogy. He just used a, an agricultural analogy when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He often uses that. And I think one of the reasons he uses it because he wants to communicate that there is a spiritual certainty here. What happens when I plant a corn seed? I get pumpkins, right? No. 
If I plant corn, I'm going to get corn. If I plant pumpkins, I'm going to get pumpkins. I'm not going to get something other than what I planted. The spiritual certainty is what I plant spiritually, that I will reap eternally. There is no if, ands, or buts about it. And these Galatians seem confused by that reality. So, Paul makes clear what that reality is in verse 8. Our second bullet is the reality. What is the reality? The reality is, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Pretty simple concept. If we sow to the flesh, meaning if we do things in the flesh, if we invest our time and our money and our effort and our actions and our relationships in the Spirit, we will what? We will reap corruption. That word for corruption means destruction. It literally means death. If we do these things in the flesh, we will reap death. Again, he's trying to communicate to them that the things that they do today are not just about tomorrow, not about next week. It's not just about these lives. It's about eternity. We must have an eternal perspective. You might ask yourself, okay, well, it says here that if we sow to our flesh, we'll reap corruption. Well, I know a lot of people, Derek, that that do a lot of sowing to the flesh, and they seem to be doing just fine. So how is that? How is it that this world can be full of so many people that don't sow to the Spirit, they sow to the flesh, and yet they're getting along just fine? Well, I'm, it's a pretty simple answer, but it's not easy for us to stomach. It's not about this life. It's not about this world. It's about eternity. And it draws my mind to, you know, the story of Lazarus, right? Lazarus, not the, not the Lazarus that was raised from the bed, dead, but the Lazarus that died, and he's, he's in heaven, and, and the rich man's in hell, and the rich man says, you know, he's, this is worse than I, I couldn't believe it. You know, give me a drink of water. He's, he's crying out. That is the reality of what this is. The reality is, is that someday when we are in eternity, we're not going to look back and wish we had more money, wish we had more cars or bigger houses or whatever, that we were more famous. The reality is, is that none of that will matter. Well, what about now? Those people have all those nice things. Well, there's also some consequences today. And some of those consequences we don't see. And some of those consequences we do see. When the person that we thought had everything they could possibly want, and they commit suicide. The person that we thought had everything they wanted, but they're the most miserable person that we know. How can somebody who makes so much money be so miserable? Because it's not about the money. How can the person who has all the cars and all the houses be so miserable? Because it's not about the houses and the cars. How can the person whether we see them in scripture, we see them in our church, we see them in our ministry updates, people who are living day to day, that are living in situations where they're ministering to people, they're loving people, but they're happy. Why? Because when we find our fulfillment in Christ, we reap. We reap good things. The second half of that, the, the difference is those who would sow to the Spirit. It says, the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And under, in order to really understand sowing to the flesh, we need to know both sides of it. When we sow to the Spirit, when we plant, when we do things, our decisions, our actions, and all of those things, when we do them in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, we reap eternal life. So another question, is Paul saying here that if we do good works, we'll get saved? That's not what he's saying. He's not saying if we do good things that that means that then we earn eternal life. What he's saying is that the good works that we do now 
have an eternal impact. Paul writes in other passages about this idea that there will be rewards in heaven, that there will be crowns in heaven. And what will we do with those crowns? We will take them and we will lay them at the feet of Christ and we will say, glory, glory, glory. Why? Because in that eternal perspective, when we're with Christ, we'll recognize that we wouldn't even be there, that we couldn't earn those crowns. We couldn't do those good works if it wasn't for him in the first place. And so when we die, all of the things that we may think are important now, what's going to happen to them? They're going to burn up like rubbish. And the only things that are going to be left are those things that we did with an eternal perspective. Those things that we sowed being led by the Spirit. In order to fully understand that, I think we need to move on to verse 9 and 10. The implication. And I'm horrible with this, I'm sorry. The implication. The implication is in verses 9 and 10. So because of this, what does this mean? What action do we take in the reality that we either sow to the flesh and reap corruption or we sow to the Spirit and reap eternal life? In verse 9, he says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. First question there is, let us not do heart in doing good. What is good? What does good mean? Well, we, we could easily look back to verse 22, the fruits of the Spirit. Good is doing the fruits of the Spirit. We could think about the greatest commandment, to love God, to love your neighbor. We could think about all the commands in Scripture and all that stuff, but I think it all boils down to the idea, are we being led by the Spirit? Again, are the decisions, the actions, the words, are the things that we are doing are we doing them with consideration to eternity, with consideration to God? Do we pray about things? Do we think through things? Do we think about, will this thing that I want to do glorify God, or will it just make me happy? Is this thing that I'm going to do going to show love to so-and-so, or is it just get me what I want? That is what it means to be led by the Spirit, we are taking the truth of God's word and then we are using it to filter out those decisions so that, we've, that we make those decisions in light of this. And we do so because the Spirit helps us to take that truth, digest it, and then use it to do those things. We are being led by the Spirit. It also says here, let us not lose heart in doing good. So the question might be there, do we lose heart? Have we lost heart? You know, I don't think there is a pastor alive that doesn't ask themselves from time to time, what difference am I making? That doesn't wonder, am I making an impact for the kingdom? Or maybe you're a teacher, or maybe you're a parent, and you're wondering to yourself, am I making a difference? You know, I'm trying to love these people, I'm, I'm trying to, to have patience, I'm, I'm trying to take this word and live it out in my life among my friends and my relatives and my fellow believers and all this other stuff, and I'm wondering to myself, is it really matter? And Paul says it does. Paul says, don't lose heart. Because what you're doing now, you may not see the fruit of that. You may not reap the reality of that until the next life, until eternity. But it's there. It is there. And we must trust God. We must trust in his sovereignty that he is using us in ways that we can't understand. And that's a hard thing to do, but we must not lose heart. I think in verse 10, he's going to help us to actually accomplish that. He's going to give us something that helps us to do that. Don't lose heart. A key component to that says, let us not lose heart in doing good for what? In due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. 
Okay, due time, what does that mean? Because that's what we want, right? We want to sow, and we want to reap, and we want to see that good stuff. You know, the farmer doesn't want to plant his crops and have to wait 13 years to harvest it, right? He wants to harvest it, and he wants to have a pretty good idea of when he's going to, I'm sorry, he wants to, he wants to plant it, and he wants to have a pretty good idea of when he's going to be able to harvest it. And that's our mindset, too. But we must understand that when he says due time there, it does not mean a set time. It does not mean a predictable time. It doesn't mean our time. It means God's time. It means the proper time. It means the right time. And we don't determine the proper time. We don't per- determine the right time. Who does? God. Why? Because he's in control because he's sovereign, because he's all-knowing, because we trust that he loves us so much that he will do those things in the proper time, that he will do it at just the right time. And if it hasn't happened, it's not the right time. And we trust that God is in control. That is faith. That is what we are called to do. So let us not lose heart in doing good, because we trust what? That God will do the thing at the right time. Not our timing, his timing. But that is hard. That is difficult. So, we turn to verse 10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I think a big part of everything that we've read so far comes down to this last verse. The Christian life is hard. Giving and giving and giving and obedience are hard sometimes. And so he says, and he closes this this section here, he says, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those of the household of faith. I think there's times where we need each other. I think there's times where God uses our good works in the lives of others so that they can do good works. I think sometimes we get so fatigued with doing those good works, we really need other people to come alongside of us in order for us to receive good works. He really, he categorizes this in two groups. He says, first, do good for all men while we have opportunity. That opportunity means while we are here, while we're in the flesh, while we are alive, while we are on planet Earth, let us use that as an opportunity to do good for all men. So that means the people we like and the people we don't like. It means the people we work with, even those ones we wish we didn't work with. It means we do it for, you know, people, whoever they are, we do good. And again, that good is is what we understand God to tell us to do. But he also kind of takes that large group and he he breaks off a subset. And that subset is those of the household of faith, fellow believers, fellow Christians. And he says, especially do good to those who are of the household of faith. Now, I think we, we do good for all people. So when we're in our workplace and everything else, we do good. We're, we're patient, we're kind, we're gentle, we're loving, we, we have a, a joyful spirit, we, you know, we, we don't don't seek out enmity and strife, and we we do all those different things. We we do that, yes. But I think we work especially hard. We have a certain intentionality. We actually, you know, you know, things happen to us in that first group, but we actually seek it out in the second group. You know, we want to go and spend time with people because we want to find opportunities. You know, I, I don't know you well enough, so I want to get to know you so that I know how to bless you, how to, to do good, how to invest in you, how to encourage you, and also so that you can encourage me, so that you can bless me. You know, one of my biggest faults is that if you need it work done in your house or you need help doing something, man, just please ask me. I want to do it. But, you know, I got some stuff to do, and, uh, you know, I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want to think, you know, I don't want to trouble people. And that is what we need to break down on both sides. So this idea that we would do good to all people, and especially those of the household of faith, we do that because God wants us to. Because that is what it means to sow to the Spirit. 
That is what it means to do things that matter for eternity. So how do we apply this? Well, I, I always hesitate to do these applications because ultimately I can't make an application for you. You have to do that. You have to take the truth as you understand it in God's word. You have to take it and you have to kind of apply it to your life and wherever you're at. But, you know, some of the applications that I take from it, maybe there are applications you can take from it as well. First one is my perspective, is my thoughts, is my actions, are my relationships, are the things that I say, the way that I say them, all of it. Is it anchored in a faith of eternity? In other words, do I think maybe this thing, this, this thing that I'm going to do doesn't really matter? And maybe God's not paying attention, so maybe it's not a big deal. Because that's a lie. That is a deception. Don't believe that. Instead, understand that everything you do has an eternal consequence. The good things that we do, they mean something in eternity. They will glorify God. But the bad things we do, they matter too. They matter because, guess what? Sin has consequence. Well, again, I, you know, those people, they do all those bad things, and guess what? They will pay for those sins. Either they will pay for those sins, or Jesus Christ will pay for those sins for them. Are we aware of that? Do we think about that in the decisions that we make, in the way that we talk to people, in the way that we take action? We should. Secondly, the Spirit, do we believe we have everything we need to love like Christ? You know, there, there's, there's lots of thoughts out here, and I'm not trying to get into the trenches, but there's this idea out there that, you know, I, I need something else in order to be obedient. I need something else in order to, to do these things. Christian, you don't. You have everything that you need in order to fulfill the Christian life. When you get saved, the Spirit comes to you and gives you the capacity. Now, we do learn to grow into that. We do learn to utilize that. But we are never in a position where we say, well, I, I just didn't know. I, I, well, it's not my fault. A sin committed in ignorance is still a sin. It is still sowing to the flesh. It, it still has a consequence. We must not use any excuse to excuse ourselves to excuse that consequence. And then lastly, seeking do we love others only when there is an obvious need, or do we seek out opportunities to do good? I say it that way because, you know, in my mind, again, this is my application for me, but sometimes in my mind, you know, it's easy for me to put the blinders up, and if I don't see the need, then I'm not compelled to help. If I don't see the need, I'm not compelled to do good. And sometimes I can get so focused that I intentionally am not looking because then I don't have to do anything. And that's not where God wants us to be. God wants us looking. He wants us taking the time to look, to seek. And when we see those needs, when we see those things, we do something about it. The church is a marvelous thing. And doing the church covenant reminds me of that, that there are benefits in our church, in our local group. And one of the greatest benefits is that mutual encouragement, that mutual, we are all desiring to do the same thing. What? To glorify God, to serve him, to worship him. And so we have the opportunity to do that together. But ultimately, there are things in our lives that are hindering us from doing that, the flesh. And it is this group of believers that can encourage and help one another to overcome that flesh, to do those things in the spirit that we are called to do. Paul wants us, Paul wants the Galatians, Paul wants this church in Perryville 
to have an eternal perspective. If we have that eternal perspective, it should impact our decisions and will ultimately reward us in eternity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that it would not fall on deaf ears. I pray that it would help us to understand that the decisions that we make, the things that we do, have an eternal consequence. Sin has an eternal consequence, but it also has a consequence today. And we see that pain and we see that suffering all around us. Help us to be different. Help us to sow to the Spirit. Help us to be led by the Spirit. Help us to do things that are difficult. Help us to love others. Help us to seek that out. We don't want to deceive ourselves. We don't want to deceive one another. We certainly don't want to be part of that mockery. We want our days to go well. But ultimately, we want to glorify you. I pray that you would help us to apply it in whatever way, wherever we're at, that you would help us to really understand that eternity is a real thing. And someday we will be there with you. And that's all that matters. Whether our days are numbered, however many we have left, no matter how hard they are, that time with you is all that matters. See you in your name, pain. Amen. Stand with me as we close with Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the fact that we can receive the Spirit through Jesus, through our love for Jesus, through our acceptance of Christ as our Savior. Lord God, I just pray that we would live our lives sowing to the Spirit. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, we would cast out the flesh and uh, only uh, sow through the Spirit, Lord. For we know that glorifies you and that, uh, Lord, that it, uh, you know exactly what we do in our lives. Uh, nothing goes unknown by you. So, Lord, we just praise you and we thank you for that relationship, for that love that you've given to us. Lord, I just thank you for these that have gathered. I just pray that uh, uh, that you would be with each one of us uh, throughout this day. Keep us safe as we travel home. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you would bring us back at the next appointed hour. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.